name is Brett and I am the CEO and co-founder of Good Lawyer. Um, I got a little bit thrust into this presentation today, so you're gonna have to bear with me because uh, unfortunately uh, our go-to presenter, Katie, is uh, not here right now and she is a hell of a lot better at this than I am, so bear with me. Um, more importantly, my good friend Josh Weinberg, who I will let introduce himself. Yeah, so uh, my name is Josh Weinberger. I uh, am a lawyer here in Calgary and have been for over five years now. And I kind of generally practice in the world of what I would call um, corporate commercial stuff, uh, business law. And over the last few years, I've had kind of a, a big focus in this sort of startup and entrepreneurial space. And uh, yeah, as Brett mentioned, the two of us sort of came up through law school together, came up through the articling process and early days in legal practice together. So uh, since Brett has uh, kicked off this venture, I have uh, also been acting as, uh, as counsel and the lawyer to Good Lawyer. So I'm pleased to be here today and to discuss, uh, yeah, some stuff around, around raising that initial, initial money to get your business going. And what Josh failed to mention is that we also played soccer together when we were like 12 years old. So we grew, we, we've known each other for a very, very long time. He was uh, the captain on the team back in the day. Uh, 10,000 foot view. Yeah. Uh, so this slide here is, is kind of a, a very high level picture of what um, many of you might be sort of uh, imagining when you hear people in the startup space talk about raising money and talking about sort of the uh, investment and financing life cycle. This is a picture of what you might kind of describe as uh, the typical um, financing pathway for a startup company. You think of sort of a, a Silicon Valley type company, they're going through uh, this sort of stereotypical picture of, of raising money and the different stages. Now, it's important to note that this life cycle and process for raising money uh, is not necessarily relevant to all startups. It's not necessarily relevant to all uh, small and medium sized businesses. So you might uh, jump in or out of the process uh, at different times. But for the purposes of, of what we're dealing with today and for our chat and the questions that we'll dive into a bit later, we're really going to focus on part one and part two. Uh, your founder, initial founder investment, and your friends and family round. And this is sort of the uh, initial stages of, of bootstrapping your company and, and getting it ready to roll. This is when Josh gave good lawyer money. So just on that note, you know, I, I was fortunate that I came from a legal background. I have tons of friends that are corporate lawyers. And, you know, I've got guys like Josh to lean on to help me through these varying stages of raising money. Um, but truly if you don't, you know, if you're not, uh, a legal tech company with lots of access to lawyers in your network, um, it's really important that you take getting the right help seriously. Smart founders protect themselves, organized founders raise faster, um, and pro founders raise cost effectively because we all know lawyers can be expensive. Obviously that's what good lawyers here sort of trying to solve for founders like you is trying to provide a cost effective solution to these really important problems. Um, but the main point here is make sure that you're getting proper legal advice, um, proper professional service advice when you're looking to raise money, because this is a really serious moment in your business and you got to do it properly to protect yourself and protect your investors, uh, as well as your company. So it just hang on here. I think we'll, we'll get into some detail around each of these, uh, points as we go on, but uh, I think just to kind of. Uh, clarify the picture a little bit. When we talk about the, the founders protecting themselves, anytime you bring investment um, into your company and you're bringing new shareholders into your, into your company, into your business, you're bringing uh, diverse interests um, and changing the sort of control dynamic of your company. So protecting yourself is about uh, protecting the founder interests and control over the business. Uh, part two here, raising funds faster as uh, Brett described um, lawyers can really add a lot of value in terms of helping you uh, navigate the process to raising funds uh, there's a lot of kind of strict compliance uh, in the securities world and in the corporate world that you have to that you have to follow in order to do this right and then the cost effective nature 
is really about uh, getting nailing your initial uh, investments in the right way, uh, bringing in money so that it's uh, legally compliant and so that the picture of what your your cap table and your ownership table uh, is supposed to look like for your business uh, accurately reflects what happens so that when you do start engaging with um, call it institutional money or strategic money, we're talking about venture capital firms or, or angel investors, um, they're not forcing you to go back and unwind and redo all this stuff because it, it doesn't look right for them and they're not comfortable giving you the, the, the new round of financing that you need. Absolutely. And <laughs> despite my legal background, Good Lawyer definitely had some hiccups along the way when we were uh, going through our various rounds. And again, we've got, you know, lawyers on the team that are help, able to help us sort of ameliorate that, like um, correct it. But for us, we made mistakes and uh, we're going to touch on that a little bit today. The things we did right and as well, the things we did not so right. Oh, I jump one. So this is what good lawyer looks like from an investment standpoint and uh, the missing piece here. And uh, if you guys think this would be something useful, we are just teasing the idea of doing another one uh, presentation like this relating to government grant funding, which we've also been able to, you know, obtain quite a bit of. So we'd love to do a presentation if there's some interest there on government grant funding, but this is all of our investor money and good lawyers started off by raising 25,000 between me and my original co-founder that number was specific so that we were eligible for that Alberta investor tax credit for anyone out in Calgary or Edmonton that's familiar with it. Um, it was pretty juicy. So that was important for us to, to get that eligibility. And then the big round we raised was our pre-seed, which came in two installments. Uh, the big chunk from a couple angel like friends and family who had known me for a very long time, but um, had some sort of money to play with and some belief in, in the thing we were trying to build. And then the other 200,000 came from a wide array of uh, people, primarily in my network, who came in with $5,000 checks, $30,000 checks. And, you know, for most of those people, it was the largest check they'd ever written. And, you know, a lot of them were colleagues from law school or from my time at the firm. Um, but really for me, when I was raising that additional money, what was really important was raising it from people that were going to add value beyond the $10,000, beyond the $20,000, because now they have some skin in the game. They have skills like Josh that are super valuable and getting them to buy into your dream and, uh, you know, put again, put a little of their own skin in the game, completely changed the dynamic of good lawyer and really propelled us forward with, as I like to put it, a small army. So just pro tip, get people that bring extra value. Over to you. Sure. So this slide here is talking about sort of this uh, initial first stage of of investment, and um, it's it's really important, I think, to think of the the founder investment more so as an organizational round rather than a financing round. Uh, typically, founders are not actually injecting uh, substantial amounts of cash or capital into the company at this stage. It's really about um, organizing your company and figuring out who uh, who your founders are and, and really what percentage of the company uh, each of them will own. So if you're, if you're a, a sole founder, well, this stage is really easy. You're the 100% owner of your, of your company. And a lot of the kind of more complex issues and, and stuff that we're going to chat about a little bit here are not, uh, are not necessarily applicable. But anytime you're going into a company now with uh, um, multiple founders, uh, really important that you nail this first stage to, uh, to figure out essentially how you want to organize your business. So there's a couple primary things that, that we want to be mindful of here, this organization, organizational step. The first, like I described, is uh, the relative ownership interests of the founders. Now, as I mentioned, it's not always uh, or typically a lot of cash that goes into the business at this time. Typically, we're allocating ownership interest in the business uh, either for a nominal amount of cash that's being injected. So the founders might uh, inject 
just enough money to get the company incorporated and to, to pay a few of the initial registration costs and that kind of thing. Um, the second most common way that, that founders uh, contribute to the company in exchange for their ownership interest is through uh, an assignment of intellectual property. So in Brett's case, if uh, we'll use the good lawyer example, Brett has a great idea for a good lawyer. He's going to assign this great idea of good lawyer to the good lawyer business in exchange for an ownership interest. So that's sort of the kind of the nuts and bolts around the IP assignment. And then the last uh, common way that founders sort of uh, are purchase or earn their ownership interest in the company is through work or services for the company. So that stage one is figuring out who owns what. Um, and then stage two here is, is really about now once you know who owns what, what are sort of the roles, responsibilities um, of each of the founders. So this stuff is really important to think about how are decisions going to be made? What if we don't agree on certain fundamental decisions for the business? How do we break ties if, if uh, there's sort of a stalemate, that kind of thing? Um, so the all important things to, to consider. I'll let Brett maybe jump in and tell a little bit of the good lawyer story and how that relates to the, the slide. Yeah, and I just had a note to, to mention today, which was don't, don't, don't jump the gun. We did. We were lawyers. We were excited that we knew how to incorporate and we incorporated years and years before we actually did anything with good lawyers. So, you know, that came with it. Another co tough conversation with uh, a guy that had been involved at that stage, who's back now, but you know, it was just something that was totally unnecessary. So I would say, you know, don't worry about incorporating until you've gone beyond just the idea piece. Like, you, you know, have you validated it with anyone else, you know, beyond your friends and family? Have you, you know, do you have customers or do you have very good customer prospects? Once you get to that stage of validation, now you know you're starting to create more than just an idea, and that's really when the incorporation becomes important, and when these delineation of rights sort of needs to happen. Um, subsequent to that, my original co-founder, um, I think that popped to the next one. Um, I think I put this on the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So my, number three there, which was. Uh, rebounding when a co-founder leaves. So again, a good lawyer did not have all our ducks in a row for that uh, possibility. And it wasn't something that my, me and my co-founder had discussed at length at any point. You know, you've got this great idea, you're trying to build it with someone and running a startup is extraordinarily challenging. And there are some, you know, a lot of bright days, hopefully, but there are obviously a lot of, a lot of difficult days as well. And Maybe I'm going to pop back to the previous slide for a second for Josh, because there's ways to build in protections and build in commitment. And if you do go separate ways at whatever point, there are mechanisms to do so fairly. And, you know, fortunate for me, my co-founder was very reasonable. We're still buddies and we were able to cut a deal that made sense. But if we were not able to cut that deal, good lawyer might have died. I mean, it would have died because the founders had different visions for the future and they didn't have the agreement in place to, to rectify that. So um, it was a risky situation and we got lucky, but something that I would definitely never do again is co-found, you know, all the blood, sweat and tears that you put into your startup without having an idea on what happens if one of us decides to get out. You really need to have a good handle on what happens if a co-founder leaves, because if you look at most startups, it happens. Yeah, so maybe pop back to that slide. So uh, the first part that I spoke about here, uh, kind of delineating the roles and responsibilities of founders, that's something that seems uh, maybe more obvious at the start when you're optimistic about the company. But addressing the second point, like Brett spoke to, um, dealing with the possibility of a founder exit can be you know, an awkward thing to do at, at the initial stage of the business when you're both excited about getting things running. But I think as Brett described, it can have uh, really serious consequences for uh, the longevity of the business if we don't have that conversation and that thought process. So I mean, it is a prenup. It's a prenup for your business and you need one. Yeah, and I mean, you wouldn't do a prenup without a lawyer and, and similar thing here to just, you know, figuring out the, uh, 
the process for a founder exit, that's something where a lawyer can add a lot of value. So I'll just talk really briefly about a mechanism, which is kind of uh, understood in the startup space as a founder vesting or reverse vesting. So this is really a concept where um, it's kind of widely practiced in the startup world and in the small business world where you have multiple founders where um, if a founder exits under certain conditions within a certain time period uh, without fulfilling certain conditions, well then we all agree that either all or a portion uh, of that founder's ownership interest in the company will either revert back to the company or revert to the other founders. So um, vesting considerations, something is, that's uh, really important to, to uh, think about and have that discussion at the top. And then I guess this is the last thing that I would touch on on this slide here before we jump ahead mm -hmm. is, uh, is really just, uh, well, how do you do all that stuff and where does that all sit? it's gonna sit in legal documentation. So this is gonna sit uh, in your initial incorporation documents. It's gonna sit in potentially uh, a founder agreement or a shareholder agreement, or depending on the nature of your business, maybe a unanimous shareholders agreement. So uh, a conversation with a lawyer, understanding uh, kind of the, the vision uh, and, and growth strategy of your business can really help figure out where the right place to, uh, to build those rights in. Are and, and how to get creative around uh, what those rights and, and uh, unique mechanisms are for your business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanna take our first audience question uh, from Merlin. When the time is right from your perspective, how much equity did you exchange for cash from your pre-seed round in general terms anyway? Um, and then what key documents did you have ready? Examples being pitch decks, biz plans, shareholder agreements, cap table, et cetera. So, for the pre-seed round, um, we gave away roughly 20%. And 20% is kind of the ballpark number for every round, um, you know, beyond the initial founder investment, which is a little squirrely for other reasons. But 20% is, is sort of your typical amount that you would look to, to raise with cash. Um, and then obviously the, the rest maintained by the current shareholders. So for us, we raised a uh, quarter million dollars um, from those two uh, angel-like friends and fam uh, at a 1.25, so exactly 20%. And uh, I can assure you it took a little convincing on that number because at that <laughs> stage, all we had was a pitch deck and a really janky MVP. So that's what we had when we went to raise. Um, I think a biz plan would be important to some people, but again, you got to think about who your audience is. Frankly, my audience was never going to read a business plan. Um, I could barely get through the pitch deck. They were, they were investing in me. Um, and you know, the idea seemed like a good enough one for them to, to roll the dice. So, uh, I think it really depends, but at the friends and family precede, um, I think a pitch deck and, uh, an MVP and ideally some customers would be, uh, what I'd be looking for if I was going to invest in it. Let's maybe uh, keep chugging. Yeah, keep keep rolling, and then we'll kind of aggregate the questions at the end. Perfect. Yeah, and that kind of leads in nicely to part three of our presentation today, which is the friends and family round. So uh, I put that little blurb in there. It's harder than it sounds, um, but I'm going to let Josh take it away, and then Megan, we'll get to your question here in a minute. So your friends and family round, uh, if we kind of are thinking of that. Uh, life cycle slide that we had at, at the start of the presentation here. This is the first time that you're actually injecting um, real capital into the company. Um, so generally, um, the goal of this stage of uh, financing is to raise enough money so that you can, you can build your minimum viable product. Um, so you're, you may also be raising enough funds to uh, sort of finance the company's upfront legal or sorry, upfront capital requirements, uh, some R and D to really figure out kind of what your what your business is and how it, and how it fits in the market, and uh, you know your sort of other uh, startup activities. Uh, as far as who you're going out to, well, we call it friends and family, but really this round is about um, trying to raise money from anybody within your network. Uh, 
um, that is uh, legally permitted to give you funds. So I say legally permitted because there are some uh, compliance rules that get sort of sticky around uh, how you're able to raise money, who you're able to raise money from, and what you're able to sell them. And uh, an important thing actually going back to the question that we re received and, and Brett's response, there's actually some sticky rules around what you're allowed to uh, show investors when you're asking them for money. So all important things to um, really uh, get some, get some advice around. Yeah. And I think, you know, sort of at like a really high level, you can't be selling to strangers on the streets and you can't be, you know, running around, town trying to get people to buy, invest in your startup. Um, that's where the securities laws come in. So um, I'm sure Josh can touch on a bit more, but yeah, there's like a very specific set of people that, you know, for more or less know you um, that are allowed to invest in your company, unless you've met a ton of requirements that I don't anticipate anyone here is going to be meeting anytime soon. Yeah. So I guess at a high level, I'll kind of address that point because it is a very important part of this process in this stage of raising funds. So who can you raise money from? Well, uh, generally speaking, all small business, all startups within Canada, when you're raising money at this stage, you're trying to fit within uh, a capital raising exemption that exists under Canadian law, which is called the private issuer exemption. So the private issuer exemption uh, is kind of a carve out from, from Canadian securities laws. And Canadian securities laws generally say, if you're a business, you cannot sell securities, so you cannot sell shares to the public unless you give the public a prospectus. And a prospectus is uh, a disclosure document about that thick. I've written many of them for, for very sophisticated clients and it takes hours and hours and hours and it's all kind of disclosure and stuff that uh, frankly, small businesses and startup companies uh, don't have and, and is uh, overkill for your business. So what the securities world does or the law of securities world is it says um, we can still protect consumers uh, under this exemption. We, so we say small businesses, you're allowed to sell your shares to uh, certain friends, family and close business associates. Um, of the initial founders, directors, and officers of the startup. Also, you can sell your securities, you can sell your common shares to really wealthy people because the law says those guys can afford to take the risk. So that's where we're talking about angel investors. They might fall into that category. Anything else, Brett, to add on that one? Um, no, I think that's great. I want to maybe just take one second here to answer Megan's question about vesting. So, um, she's from Quebec and was wondering if it was unique to Alberta, which I don't believe it is. Um, but to be specific, do you issue the shares at the start or only after the tasks are completed? So how does vesting work? Okay. Uh, so jumping back to the initial founder round. Uh, the concept of vesting, um, vesting is kind of the term that's used in the, in the startup world. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer and it's a little bit complicated, um, but really the shares are issued to the founders immediately upon creating the company, typically. So, as soon as you, as soon as you create the company, as soon as you uh, organize the, the company, each of the founders will own their respective share. So the shares immediately vest. The concept of reverse vesting is really a, a contractual right that you build in where it's an agreement of each of the founders that say, notwithstanding that I own these shares, that I've already been issued them, I've already paid for them, whether, uh, through a nominal amount of cash or th through uh, transferring over some IP or through working for the company now or in the future, um, these shares are mine. So I am agreeing under contractual terms that if I leave the company within a year, I'm going to give back 
all of the shares that I own. Or if I leave the company within 18 months, I'm going to give back 50% of the shares that I own now or 20% or whatever the deal is um, that you strike with your other founders uh, when you're creating the company. So there's lots of flexibility here. It's a contractual mechanism. You own the shares when you create the company. And a follow on to that. Um, can you establish conditions for, you know, just cause like basically ha if the founder isn't meeting a certain performance metric, um, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as I described, it is a contractual mechanism. And the beautiful thing about it being a contractual mechanism is that you can get really creative and really specific in the way that you draft up the contract. So you can come up with all kinds of conditions. You might say, well, it needs to be this number of hours per, per week or per month. Um, you can get in, into all kinds of granularity and detail. But the flip side of that is once you start getting into all that level of granularity and detail, what does that do to practically how you're running your business? What does it do to the trust level between the partners? Is that kind of an erosion of your relationship right off the bat? Um, so these are all kind of factors to consider, but yeah, uh, it's a contractual mechanism. So as far as getting creative and building in conditions, you can totally go nuts and your, uh, your lawyer will help you kind of think of the, the conditions that are appropriate for your business and for your founder group. Right on. And uh, I can field, uh, who was it here? John's question about skipping the friends and family round. Um, you know, if you don't have a network of, you know, people with money to hand out, which is pretty reasonable, I don't think a lot do. Um, my recommendation would be start getting involved in uh, the incubators, you know, the startup community, because the investors are prowling around all the time. And if you start to make waves in that community, um, you'll get noticed for sure. Um, that being said, you know, we bootstrapped it for the first year and a half on just our salaries. So um, I think bootstrapping can go a really long way in today's day and age, especially if you're able to, you know, build product yourself, which was something that Unfortunately, uh, the lawyers starting the company were unable to do. Um, okay. Moving along. These are great questions. Okay. This is another one of my sort of practical tips. Oh, hold on. Did you skip oh, ahead? Did I? Right. Okay. Sorry, Brett. There's just, there's one last, uh, kind of major theme that I think is really important that I'd like to convey about this friends and family round. The friends and family round is uh, not the round that you as founders want to give up rights or control. Um, so as much as possible, uh, if you can retain rights and not give up special privileges or special preferences or special rights to the friends and family investors that are coming in at this stage, that should be uh, along with getting enough money in the door to kind of keep your business afloat and to realize your, your business plan and, and build your dream. Uh, another primary consideration should be not giving up special rights, not giving up control um, because as you sort of work your way through that, that life cycle that we talked about on the, at the start of the presentation and you start getting involved with institutional money and strategic money that comes from venture capital and further down the road, private equity or, or whatever it may be, those actors are 100% going to insist on special rights, special preferences. It comes with a lot of strings. It comes with strings and uh, it comes with strings because that's the business that they're in, but also because they add a ton of value and they can add a ton of, uh, you know, strategic benefit to your, to your business outside of just the, the cash that's coming in. So really what you want to do is, is you want to preserve as much uh, rights and control for yourselves as the founders uh, prior to that stage. So practically what that means when you're raising friends and family money, it means that you're selling them the same class or type of share that you own as founders. So you're selling common shares here. You're not selling um, 
what you might hear out in the world described as uh, preferred shares or something like that. Now I've got a question for you, Josh. If I had to do this again, instead of the you know little legal magic we did with the voting trust thing, would non -com or sorry would common shares without voting rights be the way to go with friends and family? I think you're going to have a hard time selling non-voting shares to friends and family. Uh, I think there, there's two sides to this. You have your interests as the founder, and the investors have their own interests as as people that are putting cash into a business that is inherently the most risky investment they've probably ever made in their lives. So to ask them to say, um, give me 10 grand and you're not even going to have voting rights is maybe a, a big ask. But one thing that we had an issue with, uh, with our friends and family base is a lot of them are, are lawyers like you <laughs> and I. And so they ask for things that maybe not typical, uh, of what you would see at this stage. And, and we had to kind of maybe fight back a little bit and we had to come up with um, kind of a middle ground of something that, that makes um, more sense for, for a startup company, recognizing that, yeah, as much as uh, all of our friends and family were coming in and, and wanted to protect you know, the downside risk of their investment, they're not involved in running the company. So they don't really have a ton of leverage to ask for all these special rights. So, um, you know, we had to build in some, some special, uh, I guess, workarounds to get everybody on the same page once we realized, oh, actually what we built here is not totally practical for how we want to run the business. Yeah. And uh, now the slide I pulled up here, um, you know, sort of the good lawyer journey, the good lawyer experience on that friends and family round. And so I just wanted to highlight sort of a few of my takeaways that are nothing to do with the law, um, just some practical things that I did. And, you know, we were able to raise a, a pretty solid pre-seed round. Um, so the first one, I've kind of mentioned on it a little bit, build trusted relationships early. Um, if you don't have anyone in your network that uh, looks like someone that could potentially, you know, invest in you, then, you know, it's probably time to increase the size of that network and find some people that do because, even when you're talking about angels, you don't just hop to hop to an angel and show up one day and then they write you a fat check. Uh, they want to get to know you. So starting to, you know, build those trusted relationships as early as possible, share your wins with them, whether they're, a, you know, related directly to your startup or just other cool stuff you're doing. You got to build those relationships early. Um, leverage incentives. So for us, the Alberta investor tax credit, uh, which also kind of played into number three was a huge, windfall for us and, and, and it created an opportunity for us to um, make deals with our family and friends investors that everybody felt good about because the, the AITC, which unfortunately has been uh, terminated, provided a 30% kickback on any investment an Alberta resident did into a tech company uh, or at least a tech startup. So that was a huge thing for us. We were able to leverage that incentive and the clock was running on it as well. Uh, they terminated that at the end of 2019. And so I had a very finite window where I went to raise money and all my friends knew that they had two weeks to decide. Um, that created a, a sense of urgency and then lean on your champions. And uh, I think it's very appropriate Josh is here today because he was certainly one of mine. Uh, you know, we joked back in, in even our law school days, Josh was always the reasonable man and getting him to invest, you know, his hard earned money into a crazy tech startup uh, was a huge win for me personally and a huge win for the company because that provided that sort of belief, that comfort level that a lot of those other investors, again, guys that are writing and girls that are writing checks, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, that's the biggest check they'd ever written. So it's not a huge amount of money, but it was a really important investment to them and leaning on your early champions, people that other people trust is really how, we leveraged the round and were able to bring on um, a ton of new, new investors and again, build that good lawyer army, which has been uh, proving more valuable by the day. Anything down there? No, maybe let's jump into some of these questions. Right on. I'll just leave the key lessons for your next round up on the, on the board, but uh, I'm just going to take a look in the chat here. 
If anyone has questions, now is a great time to ask them. I've got one here. So I have a question from Wendy. And the question is, uh, what about crowdfunding? Um, we purposely left crowdfunding out of the presentation here. Crowdfunding is a, is a really kind of unique um, example and potential source of funds for your business. There's two types of crowdfunding generally to be aware of. And one is um, crowdfunding of a, what I would describe as a more charitable type. So kind of like a, like a Kickstarter type of crowdfunding. So where basically you're just saying to the, um, the Kickstarter community or the crowdfunding community, hey, I have this great idea. Um, do you want to jump in and, and help finance it with, with your individual donations? And that generally is a, is a safe place for businesses to, to jump into and to try to generate funds from. Where crowdfunding gets sticky and where you almost certainly need uh, legal advice is where you're doing crowdfunding and issuing equity to the investors that are coming in through a crowdfunding platform. So if you're exchanging common shares or an ownership interest in your business through a crowdfunding platform to somebody uh, you know, through the internet, you are 100% engaging securities laws. Um, you 100% need some professional advice to get through that. And one thing also that's really important to, to note with that uh, example is that you might actually have um, follow-on lasting compliance obligations that kick on from having uh, taken advantage of that crowdfunding exemption to raise funds. So you might now, for example, have to uh, prepare and report financial statements, which if you're kind of hanging out in the, uh, the private company startup world, you're not really obligated under the world of securities laws compliance to publicly disclose your financial statements. So um, crowdfunding through Kickstarter, not issuing securities, uh, give it a shot. As soon as you're giving up equity or securities in your company, you definitely need some, uh, some professional advice around that. Yeah. And the way that I've seen the crowdfunding work best in the past is when you're selling some sort of like tangible product and it's almost more like a pre-sale than um, an equity take. I mean, there are companies and we've been approached by a couple of them to give the equity crowdfunding a go, but it hasn't been attractive to us yet. I see the benefits being, you know, maybe some additional marketing, but um, not something that we're seriously considering at this stage. If we were selling products, that'd be a different story. So we, we might crowdfund some good lawyer swag or something, but that'd be it. Um, Okay, I've got two more questions here that are really good ones. Um, maybe we'll start with employee stock options. Um, sure. Where is that one? Uh, it's just a little ways up here. From Ted, uh, how would you reward key employees for their in-kind contributions after founders have their shares in some equity-based instrument? Great question, Ted. Uh, I'll take just a quick stab at it, Brett, and then maybe you can speak to it a little bit from the entrepreneur side. But um, as, a, as a legal advisor that works in the startup space, uh, really what we're talking about here is some sort of uh, equity-based stock option plan. So it's really common for um, small businesses, companies in the startup world to use equity as a... Um, as a carrot to incentivize employees to essentially donate their time to your startup because you, you haven't got a lot of cash in the early days uh, to be able to you know pay a, a full roster of employees so you're using um, legal tools like stock options and, and equity compensation to uh, to get those key employees in the door and to incentivize them to uh, to work in the business one thing this is um, where the concept of vesting applies uh, more traditionally. So for an option or a convertible security to vest and convert into equity, some condition precedent has to occur. So if you have 
um, a new employee and you say, yeah, I'm going to grant you X thousand dollars worth of stock options and they're going to vest in six months. So that new employee now has to dedicate six months of time working for the business before those, uh, before those options will vest and then convert into equity. So that's what, that's, uh, kind of what we mean when we traditionally talk about vesting, it's hitting this condition precedent so that your options can be exercised and converted into equity. And again, just from, you know, my perspective as CEO of good lawyer, uh, I use those options, um, all the time. And there's a cap to how much can be, um, provided. And that cap is outlined in, um, our shareholders agreement. So, uh, it's 15% of outstanding, um, equity can be in the form of employee stock options. And I intend on using all of it. Um, from my perspective, that's how I get the guys to work weekends, work way more, work, work for way less than they're worth and really buy into the dream because they know that they see upside. And, you know, for me, it's not about having guys on the team for a year or even two years. I want these guys working with me for, um, you know, a decade. So to do that, uh, early stock options for key employees that are really driving the success has been an extremely useful tool for good lawyer. Next question. Um, where are we here? From Rochelle. Hold on, hold on. Safes versus equity for friends and family. So, I mean, a safe is a version of equity. Um, so maybe just like super high level overview of what a safe's all about. Safe, uh, simple agreement for future equity. It's. Uh, it's more commonly used in um, at a stage of the company's uh, development where the valuation of the company is not necessarily set or agreed to and is maybe a little bit more fluid. So it's essentially saying, I'm going to um, give you this amount of money, which will be convertible into uh, future equity at a later date. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, I don't, I don't really have much else to add. Uh, it's popular in San Fran and, you know, it's growing in popularity in other places, but it's just a, an instrument that provides, you know, investors with a little comfort and also, you know, it basically allows you to not peg evaluation today. I mean, that's the main point of it. So yeah, that's the next question I'm going to touch on here, which was how do you go about valuating your company? Um, very good question. A uh, little shout out to Randy over at Valhalla. He does a pretty good job of explaining. Um, I can't remember the, the name of the model, but it's very simple. And it's, you know, there's five categories. I believe one is idea, one is team, one is MVP, one is, um, I think, intellectual property. And then there's a fifth, which is maybe traction or something along those lines. Um, and if you score top top scores in all and it's very subjective if your top score in all of those you're worth two and a half million bucks and very few companies would score top marks on all of those and again we're talking about the sort of pre-seed often pre-customer stage of the business um from my own experience i can tell you that it's just a negotiation with your investors and how well you can sell the story because uh, how much is good lawyer worth today? <laughs> it's really hard to guess, but um, you have to pick a number, or at least I felt like I had to pick a number to raise money. And so um, I picked, the, frankly, the largest number that I thought the investors would stomach and be okay with. And uh, luckily they were. I got one here. Okay. Take it on, bud. Okay. So we've got a question here from Andy. Um, Andy's question is, are investors actively involved in company management like how the company can use the money and and so on so this is a really important question andy and this kind of goes to uh, the point that i was trying to make around the friends and family round uh, you have competing interests you have the the interests of the founders and of the company where you want to maintain control and you have the interests of uh, the investors that are incoming 
where they see this as a really risky place to toss their money and they might ask for a little bit of uh, control or special rights or uh, informational rights, that kind of thing, in order to get the money in the door. So we're kind of resisting these, these two competing rights at the friends and family stage. And I already gave you an example of why it's important to, um, to sort of preserve uh, as many rights for the founders and not give up a, a whole lot of management it rights to the shareholders at this stage. Having said all of that, if you give up voting shares, which is what I'm recommending uh, at this stage typically happens, is that you, you're issuing the same class of shares, common shares, um, to your friends and family investors that the founders hold, with that carries voting rights. And corporate law says that there's certain fundamental uh, decisions and, and certain fundamental uh, actions that companies take where shareholders get to vote on that matter. So in a certain sense, there's always some decision-making power and some decision-making control that um, flows to your new investors as shareholders of the company. So that's why it's really important to um, make sure that you get legal advice at this stage so that you aren't inadvertently giving up a huge voting block of control to these new investors so that now all of a sudden you've, uh, you've lost the type of control that you would expect to have as, uh, as the founder and the original owner of the company. Yeah, I think that's well said. And uh, just touching on Arthur's uh, question about valuation, in that really early pre-seed stage, there it's more or less fiction you're trying to indicate to the investor that there's this huge opportunity and that you know you're the team that's gonna gonna take take it there um when you get a little further along and where i'm sort of sitting now because we're looking to raise money uh middle of next year is comparables and so you know not necessarily just legal tech comparables because there's not a lot of them out there but comparables you know for us it would be things like where's health tech going you know, where is insure tech going? Where are these similar looking platforms and what are their traction metrics and how much are they raising? And so that for us is going to be really, uh, the focus on the next round is going to be looking at comparables and then trying to fit, fit good lawyer in an attractive light to, you know, which are you know, inevitably going to be more sophisticated investors who are going to be doing more due diligence. So, um, for us having comparables to lean against and say, Hey, we look a lot like those guys and they just raised 10 million bucks is going to be really helpful for our next round. But that's a little beyond uh, the conversation today. How are we for time? We've got five more minutes. Okay. Um, There's a couple here that I can speak to. Yeah. I think the convertible debt one is particularly interesting because it's so popular. Okay. Well, I, I think I can answer this quickly and then you jump in Brett, if, if you think there's additional sure. stuff to add on that, but, uh, we have a question from Nathan. Can you speak briefly about convertible debt as an option for financing? Um, in the stages that we've spoken about so far, convertible debt is a really bad idea to get into. Now, the, the concept of convertible debt is really you're issuing a security, which is a debt instrument that later can be um, on, you know, on some condition precedent, switches and becomes equity and ownership interest in the company. The reason why I say it's a bad idea at this stage is because um, it almost will always carry a, a interest rate and because of that, it becomes expensive money. So now if someone is willing to give you $100,000 of convertible debt, which later is going to convert into $100,000 of equity, you also has to service these interest payments on it. So at the first stages here of, of sort of bootstrapping uh, your company, you don't want to be paying interest fees to one of your initial financiers, one of your initial investors, my sense. Yeah, and my just two more cents on it would be um, convertible debt comes with a hammer. The hammer is that you can convert it into equity or you can leave it as debt. If the entrepreneur, the startup founder has the hammer, fine, then convertible debt is great. 
but that is almost never the case. Almost always it's going to be the investor with the hammer. And from my perspective as a startup founder, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that I don't have control over something so important because if you know, you're an early stage startup and all of a sudden, you know, you still have a little bit of cash, but the investor wants to throw that hammer down and turn it into debt and, you know, you have to repay it. That could tank the company. It might be able to, you know, the investor might be able to get some of their money out before it goes down. But as the founder and as a company, it's a hammer that's going to be used to crush you in my view. Yeah. I, I, especially in these initial stages, let's try to stay away from, anything complex it really the the goal here is to get money in the door as smart as possible as cheap as possible um and getting good advice and keeping it simple is is really the best way to do that i think totally and i mean good lawyer everybody owns the same type of equity at good lawyer and i did that intentionally because we're all on the same ride together and that's going to change when we raise the more sophisticated money down the road but right now like the good lawyer army I keep on referring to that, you know, guys like Josh, the co other co-founders, everybody, the early investors, we're a unit and, you know, we're all in this together. And I think uncomplicating the equity has helped facilitate this amazing alignment with everybody on the team. Should we do another one? Okay. We uh, have time for one more question. Let's have a look. And uh, then we're going to have to wrap it today. Really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, I also wanted to time this event because for anybody interested, uh, we are head, one of the featured companies at Startup Calgary Launch Party. If you Google Startup Calgary Launch Party, you can't miss it. It starts in an hour and a half. And uh, anyone you know that enjoyed this, if you can come out and give us a quick vote, uh, there'll be more free stuff given away there. And uh, would love to see some folks out uh, supporting Good Lawyer and the other awesome startups here in town. You got one more question, Josh? I think, yeah. Okay, I think the last question that... What about the 51%? Yeah, yeah. that's the one that I yeah. have. So the yeah. last question that I want to address here is from... The mythical 51%. Yeah, is from Ben. And Ben's question is around, uh, if founders retain 51% um, after they've done these financing rounds um, and your investors still want a voice what can you do um, and he has a question here set up a board so um, a little bit earlier I spoke about when new investors come in they're going to have rights under corporate law as shareholders the most important right that shareholders have is that shareholders vote to elect the directors and the directors run and manage the company. So if you think in, in the uh, typical startup context, if you are the founder, you want to control the shareholder vote so that you can elect and appoint yourself as the director so that you're responsible for the management and operation of the company. So that's where this magic 51% number comes in. Um, if I control 51% of the votes, 51% of the shareholder equity, well, I can appoint myself the director and I can maintain control of the company. All right, folks, that's all we got in us today. Um, you know, one more time, thank you to Josh for joining me. It's always a pleasure. Um, and, uh, thank you everyone for joining us as well. It's been fun. And, uh, like I said, if I get enough notes about doing uh, another one of these with uh, another guy on our team, Zach, on the government grant piece, because we've also been able to secure a ton of government funding over the last 12 months. Um, if I get enough interest, we'll do another one of these soon. Uh, all the best. Hope to see some of you out at Startup Calgary. And uh, we'll be launching Good Lawyer Pro tonight. So stay tuned. Cheers, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the presentation. I don't want to lose the cat. It's so bad. I'm trying to.
This is why you don't let these guys.